I'm Lauren Graham. I am a dermatologist at UAB. And I, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit, kind of talk more about... Hold on. There we go. How's that? Does that work? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, don't look at all these things that I do all the time. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay, I have no disclosures to discuss today, but I am going to be talking about off-label medications, which is what everybody today has been talking about, because unfortunately there's not a lot that's FDA approved for um, sarcoids. So um, I know they already did this earlier today, but I just want to say again, so who has sarcoid in this audience? You want to raise your hand? Lots of hands. And then who's a loved one or a caretaker or someone who doesn't have it? So I just want to applaud all of you, both the people who have sarcoid, because it's hard to have a chronic disease, and the loved ones here, because it's also hard to take care of someone with a chronic disease sometimes. So um, I think it's great that you guys are all empowered here to, to be here today. So skin is the second most commonly affected organ for sarcoidosis after the lungs. Um, we often don't get as much uh, maybe press because laymen don't, a lot of people don't think the skin's important. Um, anyone who has skin disease here can tell us and can vouch for how important it is. Um, and there's a third of the patients only have skin involvement. So sometimes these people get, you know, don't get diagnosed quickly. They're told they just have a rash, oh, don't worry about it. Um, or, you know, people, as a lot of people have already experienced, don't have a lot of comfort level with sarcoids, so they don't know what it is. Um, it usually occurs before or concurrent to the systemic disease. And there's an unknown percent of patients who have skin before systemic. So as you've kind of been a theme here, and as you guys know as patients and loved ones, there's so much we still don't know about sarcoid um, and skin sarcoid specifically as well. So how do you diagnose skin sarcoid? It's usually diagnosed with a skin biopsy. I know we've talked about lung biopsies already. Skin biopsies are much easier. They're probably the easiest biopsy you can get. Um, so I know a lot of the other specialties often send patients to us because it's much easier and simple to get a skin biopsy than to get other biopsies. And so we, um, we like to try to help um, everyone else by doing that. Sometimes you can just diagnose by what we call like a typical skin spot, but I'm going to get to that there's not, um, there's lots of different ways it can look. So typical is um, in quotation marks, of course. So this is kind of how it works. People sometimes are scared of biopsies for you, the patients out here who've had a biopsy, you know, um, you know, you have anxiety until you understand something. So it's a stick and a burn for numbing. It burns for about 30 to 60 seconds. It feels like a little pinch or a bee sting. And then I explain to people, it's like a cookie cutter, you know, like the cookie, sugar cookie shapes that you get, but much smaller. Um, it's like a pencil eraser size. And um, we just take a little piece of skin. It's like a little plug, see here? Um, and then you get this skin sample, and we look at it under the microscope, and there's where you can see the granulomas that everyone's already talked about. And I'm not going to go into much about the granulomas or anything, because I know everybody else has talked about it. So that's how we can diagnose skin sarcoidosis. So it, like I said, it's a very simple procedure. So if you, um, obviously people here already know they have sarcoid, but if you, people reach out to you and say, I think I have it, if they have a rash, um, tell them to please come to dermatology. Now, with that being said, you can have rashes and have it not be sarcoid. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Just because you have sarcoid and a rash doesn't mean your rash is from sarcoid. You can just get you can get anything that everybody else can get too. But that's just something to keep in mind. So, what does skin sarcoid look like? So, we teach our our residents and our students it's the great mimicker, or it can look like anything. So that's why I had typical in the leather slide in quotation marks, because there, there are a couple things that can be typical, but in general, it can look like anything. So here's a patient, this is her leg. Um, you can see that it's hard to tell from a particular picture, but it's these raised up, kind of thick, um, and then they're a little lighter than her natural skin color. So here's her natural skin, and then you can see it's a lot lighter. And these can be quite tender for people. Um, this is a gentleman's back. Um, so yes, it looks similar to this one, that it's you know lighter than his natural skin color, but I mean, these look totally different, um, and they're kind of just scattered all over his back. And then this is someone else's back, who it's, instead of it being lighter, it's red, 
and it, instead of it being thick like this, it's actually kind of wasting away. It's like um, what we call atrophy. Um, so it can look in a lot different. So then here's, some people mention it can be on the face, it can be very debilitating, but it can be debilitating anywhere. So this is a gentleman who had, here's his forehead obviously, but then this was on his whole scalp. So under all that hair, he also um, had these plaques. This was all sarcoid. And then here's a picture of another person's forehead that looks totally different. So I put these pictures, you know, the pictures of the back, um, and then the pictures of the forehead together for, to say, I mean, would you have guessed that this is the same thing? Probably not. So when in doubt, you know, come see a dermatologist um, or an expert and someone who's comfortable with sarcoid. And it's, you know, we try not to biopsy the face because it does leave a scar, but we definitely can do it if we need to. So like I said, there's different types of classic sarcoid. This one is probably the most known, actually, you know, typical lesion that we probably wouldn't do a biopsy for. Um, you see, this is called um, lupus hernia, which is funny because it has nothing to do with lupus. If anybody knows, um, you know, the other autoimmune, another autoimmune disease called lupus. Um, so that can be confusing for people. But lupus hernia is sarcoid of the skin. You see it on the nose, the ears. And this is, this is really important for us to recognize, for skin doctors to recognize, because it often indicates that people do have lung involvement. So like I said before, you can have skin involvement only, um, but if you do have a rash on your face like this, or if you know someone who does, um, you know, we get those to the pulmonology doctors pretty quickly. And they often can be a sign that they're harder to treat. You can get the deeper nodules, as I showed that other woman's leg, uh, but sometimes you can't even tell on the surface of the skin that they have something, but the patients know it, obviously. You know it if you have it, because it's kind of deep under the skin. You can see that. Um, scars. So sarcoid's known to come in scars. So if you have an old surgical scar, uh, if you have um, tattoos, um, that, and then areas of trauma. So if you have IV sites, which, you know, Obviously, when people are sick, you can't help it. You go in the hospital, you got to get an ID, but that can be a site where skin sarcoid will show up. Allergy shots is another thing. So as Dr. Gaff already mentioned, you can get erythema nodosum, which he, he was talking about more about the eye, but um, you can get it. It's these kind of deep nodule, painful, tender nodules on the, on the front of the legs here. That actually is a good sign. Often that means that... Um, the sarcoid could resolve in two, in two years. Um, it's rare, but we see it. Um, then you can get other things like deposition of calcium. So you can get these kind of hard white deposits of calcium um, in the skin. You can see that with sarcoid. And then you get rashes of neutrophils, which are just kind of these red, juicy, tender um, rashes that we see. So treatment. So people have talked about a lot of the treatments already, but one thing that we're lucky about in the skin is we have access to our organ. Um, so the other specialists here know they make fun of dermatologists for using a lot of creams, but we just say we're lucky because we can see what we're looking at and see, and we can touch our organ. So we just say the other the specialties are jealous of us. But um, so anyway, so if you have not a lot of disease and it's just a couple spots, we can use steroid creams, and that often is all you need. Um, it's good, and we have lots of different kinds. Um, some of them are stronger than others. The skin of the face, the armpits and the groin are the areas that we like to use less strong steroids because the skin's thinner there. Um, and then the skin's the thickest on the back, the hands, the feet. And so we kind of just um, customize what we're going to do for you depending on where your skin involvement is. The reason we do that is because you can get side effects from using steroid creams long term. It can cause thinning of the skin or atrophy, which if you look here, um, this Made, it looks just kind of thin, kind of wrinkled, more wrinkled skin than, than the age of the person should be. Um, you can see here on this young woman's face, she's been using steroids on her face for a long time. And you can see all these kind of red, we call these telangiectasias, which are blood vessels. And then here is um, a, a gentleman's armpit, but you can see you get stretch marks, which people get stretch marks anyway, but then these, these steroid creams can cause more of that. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you are using them long term and you do see those side effects, you might want to uh, talk to your dermatologist about that. Mm -hmm. Another thing we can do, which works really well, are interlesional steroids. What does that mean? That means shots of steroids. So, as people have mentioned, you know, if someone has lung disease, you take mm -hmm. steroids by mouth. But we can give it to you as a shot, um, not like when you go to the doctor and you're sick and they put a shot in your in your bottom. It's a shot that we put in the skin disease directly in there. 
um, that can, can treat the skin disease in itself. Depending on how extensive you have it, that may not work. But if you just have, I have a patient that um, we were just talking about who has it all over her nose. So we just put little shots in her nose and it works really well. She has lung involvement too, um, but then we can control just her skin on her nose um, so that we don't have to change her systemic medicines just for that. So um, that also has the si same side effects. We have to be careful about that. But then there's these new creams that are what we call steroid sparing creams and ointments. So that's again why you want to go to see a dermatologist if you need those. Then the next thing, which hasn't been mentioned as much because when someone has other um, organs affected, these usually aren't good enough. But if you have skin only or if your other organ systems are controlled and we just need to kind of get you over the hump with your skin, um, there's two antibiotics, doxycycline and minocycline, that have been shown to work really well for the skin. Not because we think it's a bacterial infection, but because these antibiotics are also anti-inflammatory, so meaning it's just kind of calm the immune system down. And then hydroxychloroquine, which is Plaquenil, which I know has already been mentioned, that also does not decrease the immune system. And then there's the ones that everybody's already talked about when you have more um, kind of really bad skin disease or if you have other organs involved, there's lots of others. Um, from a skin standpoint, we usually don't use Embrel because it can make your skin worse. So that's something to keep in mind. For other organs, they may want to use it, which is fine if you don't have skin disease. Um, but for, for skin, we don't recommend using Embrel. So one thing I just wanted to um, encourage you guys, if you aren't aware of yet, is, and, and you're empowered because you're here, which I think is great, but all clinical trials in the United States are listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so I just wanted to, um, if people aren't aware of this website, it's a great website, um, just to feel empowered for yourself. Um, so don't go to clinicaltrials.com, by the way, that is not, they have hijacked it and given it something that you don't want your children to Google. So but just keep in mind, it's .gov, okay? Um, but then it, you can put in what you want. So I just did this actually today, because I like to do it right before a talk. Um, and there's um, a lots of studies. Now some of them aren't recruiting yet, some of them are, are stopped, some of them are done. But you just, you can type in sarcoid, and it just comes up with every clinical trial in the country and what's, been going, and what's going on. Um, obviously there's some in Alabama, but for those of you who don't live in town, or those of you who move or something and you can't um, get here, it says other places that are looking at trials too. Some of them are just um, you know, questionnaires and then some of them are medicine and everything in between. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to talk about some tips for skin. So sarcoid can really itch and really bother people on the skin, but dry skin really itches too. And so one of the biggest battles, especially in the winter, that we have with people is to just get their skin well moisturized and less dry. That can help everybody. So even then people at the caretakers in this room, oh, these are good tips for you, okay? I t I, anybody who's my patient, I laugh. I'm, I'm the fun killer when it comes to things that smell good. Anything that smells good can be <laughs> irritating to your skin. So if you have sensitive skin or if you have skin sarcoid and you just can't get rid of that itch, the first thing we do is get rid of everything that smells good. So no perfumes, um, your laundry detergent, if your laundry smells good, that means it has fragrance in it. Your laundry can still be clean and not smell. Um, so fragrance-free detergents, fragrance-free soaps. Um, antibacterial soaps, if your doctor tells you to use them because you have some kind of skin infection, then that's all, you know, then do what they're telling you to do. But if not, you really don't need antibacterial soap and it can be for your body and it can be very drying. Oh, one other tip that, um, I learned when I trained in dermatology is fragrance free and unscented do not mean the same thing. So if any of you guys have gotten um, moisture lotion that kind of smells bad, um, that's because some of the ingredients just don't smell good. And so a lot of times they put ingredients in so that it masks that bad smell. Um, so that's unscented. So unscented is, has a ton of fragrance in it. So actually fragrance free is what you want. Uh, so moisturizer a lot. Um, ointments are the most effective, but they're often greasy, and so it, some people love that feeling, and some people just hate that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't like that feeling, creams are also great. If anything's in a pump, it's too thin. Um, they put alcohol in, the, in it to get through that little straw into the pump. So if you have dry skin, I want an ointment or a cream, so a tube or a jar. 
if money is an issue, original Vaseline or is three to five dollars. If you get generic petroleum jelly, it's a dollar, um, and that can go a long way. And then the last thing is that for people who do who have bad skin sarcoid of the face, obviously we want to treat you through medicines, but there also are great cover-ups that you can do in the meantime. Or as we've mentioned before, you weigh the pros and the cons of the side effects of the medicines. So if it's not worth the side effects to you, there are some great cover-ups here. Um, anybody's welcome to take a picture of this slide if you'd like. Um, and this is just Dermablend's known in the dermatology world. They have a lot of um, patient videos and everything. You know, it's used for lots of other things besides sarcoid as well. Um, but you can see here's a woman taking her makeup off and look at and look at the difference between her skin color. Um, this is a guy who has tattoos over literally his whole body, and then he's got the cover up on, and you can't even tell. So, last thing, do you need a dermatologist? Well, I'm biased, but I would say yes. Um, but one thing that's important is whatever kind of your organ is worse is usually driving the medicines. So some, you know, if you have really bad lung sarcoid or, or heart lung, cardiac sarcoid, you know, you may not be going to the dermatologist for us to manage your skin. But if you are on an immunosuppressive medication, it increases your risk of skin cancer. So mm -hmm. if you are, you should be getting a skin check once a year. So that's valuable even if we're not managing your, your uh, skin sarcoid. And lastly, like I said before, empower yourself. Obviously, you guys are already doing that because you're here. All right, thank you.